in 2010, uh, Andre Perry also served on the mayor-elect Mitch Landreau's transition team as the co-chair of the Education Task Force in New Orleans. A native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Perry earned his PhD in education policy and leadership from the University of Maryland College Park. His research and teaching interests are college access and retention, charter schools, and immigrant educational rights. And in 2011, the University of New Orleans Press released his book, The Garden Path, The Miseducation of a City. In it, Perry used nonfiction narrative to illustrate the real life tensions involved in post-Katrina education reform in New Orleans. And today, uh, Dr. Perry will be speaking on education reform starts with community, for community reform lessons from Hurricane Katrina. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Andre Perry. Thank you very much. Oh, this works very well, because I don't like to stand in front of a podium for very long. I, I get claustrophobic. And so uh, first I want to thank all the organizers for um, daring to bring me down and speak to you for a few moments. I'm, I know that I'm probably um, one of the speakers that most of you can um, resonate with a great deal because you're talking school reform and it is a, a hot bush button issue. Um, as I came in, several people asked, I'm very interested in what you're going to say. Code word, are you for or against charter schools? Um, are you against unions? Are you this? And so hopefully I can share a little bit of what I think from, my lesson, from the lessons learned from my experience in education in New Orleans. And I'll just give you a little bit of background. I actually started off as a more of a higher ed policy person. Um, I worked on the DREAM Act um, way back in the day when Orrin Hatch um, and folks were considering it prior to 9-11. I was at College Park at the time. 9-11 came and I continued my uh, doctoral work on, on, in the area, but um, obviously that it's not until now until we started really um, getting into that pol those policy issues. But I came to New Orleans in 2004. Um, I was an assistant professor there, um, minding my merry business. Um, a year passed, doing well, publishing, doing all the things that I'm supposed to do as an assistant professor. The storm came. Um, I evacuated to North Louisiana with my then girlfriend, now wife. Um, we came back. She is a, a first responder. She is a physician. I was an ed education person because I knew at that moment that education was going to tra uh, change dramatically because 80% of the school stock flooded. And so they needed folks just to figure out what are, are we going to do in terms of schooling in the future. So I rushed, rushed down to Baton Rouge. Um, I actually got into the city early, a week after, because my wife was the first responder. She got me in. I got involved in a bunch of meetings. Um, all the while, I'm writing like crazy. Um, going to, again, going to me meetings, organizing. A year passed as we started to recover. The University of New Orleans already had a charter school in place run out of the university. Um, and after doing a lot of work, the dean asked me, hey, would you be interested in helping us rebuild our own charter and opening up others to get schools off the ground in the local community of Gentilly? So I agreed. Um, and so, and from that, I did that about four or five years. Left, um, and just a couple years ago, did research on the topic. And now I'm going back into the administrative, an administrative role, taking what I've learned around schools to create a new college of education that what I think will respond to the needs of urban communities. So I just wanted to give you that background. Uh, I, I did non-traditional stuff all my life. I actually created mobile units for immigrant workers, um, for migrant workers um, up the Midwestern and Eastern streams. Um, I've never been a, uh, a traditional teacher. 
I was always a policy person and I did migrant education stuff. And so I come from a very different place. Um, and so I'm going to begin. These are the goals. I'm going to provide some background on the context and the context. I'm going to uh, review some of the key uh, reforms after Hurricane Katrina and discuss the trade-offs. Um, and some uh, burning questions, as I was preparing, I kept asking myself, how do you teach post-Katrina uh, post education reforms? Because how you teach it ultimately reflects um, your perceptions of the people in that, uh, that, uh, you're, that are involved in, uh, that are subjected to the reform. So um, I'm very clear, education ultimately exposes our biases, our perceptions, our beliefs, clearly. And so I want you to also think about that as well. And another burning question, how do you teach this stuff to children? Because I'm one of those folks, uh, a Du Boisian, I, one of my favorite books, Souls of Black Folk, and, he, and in that book he, he said that the very important question, how does it feel to be a problem? And I think what that meant, and a lot of other people believe, uh, believe that, that um, it had something to do with folks understanding how they are perceived and developing a self-concept in a way that is responsive um, to that perception and, and giving them the education and the, the skills to navigate a social terrain that is not necessarily um, favorable to you, but also to protect yourself from internalizing some of those negative perceptions. And so I also want you to think about that, that um, as we go out and teach, that we have to consider how it is taught and its impact on how children and adults perceive themselves. Another burning question is, what are valid measures of, um, of improvement or success? And clearly, I'm in this space that I'm always struggling with, school-based outcome measures versus community-based measures. And what is the point of all this? What's the ultimate goal? I want you to always keep that as I present this, these data. I want you to keep that in mind. What is the point of school reform? What's the point of education? You should have some concept of, uh, of this question as you move forward in your work. So first, the context. Let's. Um, let's look at um, some hi history. Um, if you can see the, the green line is, um, are total students, blue line are black students, and um, that orange line are, are white students. And you can see starting in the, I would say, 60s, certainly 70s, white students started to depart the system at um, an alarming rate. Um, but so did black students, the number um, started to leave, but um, black students certainly dominate uh, the numbers. Um, in the 2004-2005 school year, 68% um, were African American in New Orleans, or of the total population uh, are African American, and the New Orleans public schools, 94% were black. Um, in New Orleans, 38% of, of the children are probably, and that's a very high number, 73% um, were eligible, eligible for free lunch. Um, and, you know, as the speakers all said in terms of um, unnatural versus natural disasters, um, it is very hard to to say that the storm was the, the causal factor of, or the storm was the causal factor of all the problems of New Orleans, particularly around schools. We had constant turnover of, of superintendents. The school system was about $50 million in debt. 
Um, we had poor fiscal management. The FBI investigated several board members. It was a complete mess um, in terms of organizational um, performance. So in 2003, the state legislature voted um, to create the recovery school district. District. The recovery school district was not created after Katrina. It was something that was created before. And I want to, to um, I want to make, I wanted to say that because most people think recovery school district, they think of after the storm. But I, I want you to know that there was a movement afoot to um, increase the number of charter schools prior to Katrina. Um, this did not occur. What you will see later in the slide did not occur um, or wasn't a conception or an idea after the storm. All this stuff um, was planned out before the storm. Now, if, if I'm constantly asked the question, do you think this would have happened at the magnitude that we will see here in a few minutes? Um, without the storm, I do not think so. But I also know that there was going to be some change in the work, works. And um, before Katrina, RSD took over a handful of schools. We were the first school to take over a school, uh, first, you know, first entity to take over school, the University of New Orleans. Um, I'm going to, about eight, I'll just put it, make it clear, about 80% of the schools in New Orleans were deemed failing for the month, 80%. Um, to, to put it in some perspective, um, the average ACT score was about 16.5, so nowhere near um, uh, at a level where you could get into a selective college or university. Um, performance is just abysmal. We were always um, ranked as one of the lowest performing states, so it's not just New Orleans, it's the entire state that is low performing. So right after the storm, um, governance. So where I'm going to talk about a lot right now is governance. Um, so there was a low bar what was considered failing in Louisiana, and this is where it gets somewhat controversial. After, immediately after the storm, gov then the Governor Blanco, Democratic governor, um, uh, worked with legislators and stakeholders in the area, particularly the um, charter school reform lobby, pro-choice lobby, to heighten the bar to increase the number of failing schools so they could then become eligible to be in the recovery school district. So before there were um, 10, 15 schools eligible to be in the recovery school district, after that legislation was passed, uh, all but 20 schools, so of the 120, about 100 schools were then eligible to be taken over. Why it's controversial is because um, many of the schools that were deemed successful were now deemed failing, eligible for takeover. And so, as you can imagine, principals, teachers, um, staff members who were in um, successful schools by the state standard were then deemed failing eligible for takeover. Um, so again, that, I just said that with the new authority of the state um, via the RSD took over more than 100 schools. Um, both the RSD and um, Orleans Parish School Board allowed some schools to reopen as charters in the years following the storm. The two districts now existed side by side. And so you have the recovery school district and you have the New Orleans public schools. And I'm going to show you a, a small chart to, exam to show you what that looks like. So, um, and at that point, after the storm, and then from there on out, New Orleans has more charter schools than traditional schools. So this, and this graph is a little bit dated, but um, because we've increased the number of charter schools, um, the, the, the far 
your left, um, those represent the recovery school district schools. The state actually, man, the middle, the state actually manages directly two schools. And the Orleans Parish School Board manages, um, directly manages four schools, but they also charter. And I'll talk about this later. 80 or 90% of students educated in New Orleans attend a charter school. For the most part, it is a complete charter district. Um, and so this number has changed. It's now up to 90%. But as you can see, and I think this was taken in, um, the, we did this in 2011, 2010, 2010, 2011 school year. We increase every single year. So the process has been to deem a school failing and then to um, put it up for, make it eligible for a charter. A nonprofit can apply for it. Um, there is an approval process. Some of you may know um, NAXA, the National uh, Association of Charter School Authorizers. They evaluate the applications, and then they decide whether or not um, that applicant is deemed worthy. The state um, endorses it, and then they get the school. Um, in addition, there is another major reform. We have no attendance zones in New Orleans. And so if you're familiar with the city, and I'll show you a map of it, if you live on the West Bank, you can apply to go to a school on the East Bank, um, which causes a number of problems. While you, you have the benefit of choice, you, you could literally live across the school um, from across the street from a school and not be able to attend because it's filled up. And so it's the complete choice system in, 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 the re, in a sense of that there are no attendance zones. Um, however, a few of the Orleans Parish School Board um, schools have selective admission schools. And the reason why you, now the Orleans Parish School Board, you'll see this, are very high performing is because they had the schools that were not deemed failing. In order to protect their, their, themselves, and this is, and I'm, I, can, I might be opining here, but they created a charter, they created charter schools somewhat to create conditions um, to protect the enrollment processes of that school. Um, I'll move forward. The proportion um, student demographics. We pretty much have the same demographics as the past. However, what you're seeing now is a, a higher, um, a lower amount of, of low income folks in the Orleans Parish schools and a much higher percentage of low income in the RSD schools. Because again, the high performing, the schools that were never failing were already in the Orleans Parish School Board. They were your selective, so test, um, test, testing schools. So you have to get in, a, a, pass a test to get in to some of them. Or they have um, some attendance zone in, in, in general, in a, generally in a high income neighborhood. So as you can see, the percent of public school students in New Orleans eligible for free lunch hasn't really changed a great deal. Um, but you can see, if you look at the Orleans Parish School Board charter schools, they have the lowest percentage of those um, for free and reduced lunch. So again, those are your selective admission schools for the most part. Um, percent of special needs. The RSD school has the highest percentage of special needs students. The Orleans Parish School Board has the lowest percentage. Human capital policies. Um, 
the RSD schools are not bound by any um, collective bargaining or union contract. The charter schools are not subject to state tenure and seniority laws. M most schools offer teachers a one-year contract. Um, the RSD and its charter schools have used national organizations to attract less experienced teachers. And this is a complicated slide, but I want you to pay attention to the bottom blue line. So prior, the, the number of teachers with zero to one year experience was around 12%. After 2007, 2008, it ballooned to 37%. Um, it's now around 37% in the RS, but it's, they're concentrated in the recovery school district. So the Orleans Parish School Board has, by, I mean, uh, overwhelmingly majority veteran teachers. It is hard to get in the Orleans Parish school, schools as a teacher of any sort. Um, but the Recovery School District uh, um, developed a contract with Teach for America and the New Teacher Project um, to provide um, teacher or workforce in their schools. And you're seeing that um, in dramatic fashion. School finances. Um, because of the large influx of federal dollars, um, the per pupil average is, has you know, more than doubled. Now, that includes facilities. We receive $2 billion to rebuild facilities. Every student by the year 2015 will be in either a new or refurbished building. Um, and, I, and, and I'm actually, well, I was. I just left my position. But I, I was on the Facilities Master Planning Commission um, that uh, oversees that process, or well, well, we try to oversee the process. Um, and so you can see here um, the amount of funding per pupil expenditure um, more than doubled, um, because, primarily because of the large influx of federal dollars over time. And so when we, and people always ask me, are we better or worse than before? Um, we are living in a very different landscape than we ever did before. We have new buildings, um, more money. Um, it's a different world. You had a quick question. Just wanted, uh, that same, the population yes, it, it, it considerably. No, well, in this case, we looking we're looking at. Um, um, the, the real, it, it does in, impact, but the real um, influx of money was the, really the, it's really three billion ex additional federal dollars that were not there. That's the real game changer there. And we went from around 70,000 students to 40,000 students, which is significant. Um, so after the storm, uh, in general, school performances are going up. Um, there are far fewer failing schools. Um, ACT scores are going up. Everything is moving in an upward trajectory. Um, we are, in terms of growth, we are outpacing the, um, we are outpacing other cities in the state. We, we're going to, at some point, outpace the entire state in terms of growth, not in terms of absolute number, because still, the recovery school district is the, the lowest performing um, district, one of the lowest performing districts in the state. And I always say, because my schools, um, we um, got out of failing status fairly quickly, and I always explain it, it um, we went from abysmal to mediocre, um, but, um, and I'll talk about the benefits and the pros and cons of this decentralization in a moment. Um, you can see, it, I, I just want you to see the slope. Things are moving in an upward direction in terms of 
on this case, fourth grade, um, for the, the students on our LEAP test, um, our statewide e exam, things are going up. But it, it, if you pay attention, they were going up prior to the storm. So there's some argument. Um, are we improving at a faster rate than we were prior to the storm? Probably not. Um, it's not significant, but we are improving. So it, in the very least, the reforms in terms of growth on, in terms of test performance um, did not harm them. But um, I don't think you can make a claim that, um, that it's better than in terms of um, the rate of growth. S eighth grade, I'll, on every most measures you're seeing growth. Um, and here, it's just, I wanted to show you the, in 2005, the orange is where we were, the blue is where we generally are, and the blue number is going down every year. And so, in terms of outcome data, um, we're improving. Now let's get into the trade-offs. So, for those who didn't hear me at lunch, what's the quickest way to close the academic achievement gap? Fastest way. There's a very fast way to close it. Uh, that's one way. I even I know a, a faster way. One way is to not educate white people, right? We can stop, we can suppress white learning and we can solve the achievement gap. We wouldn't do that, right, for a number of reasons. <laughs> However, we will do what you just said. We will suspend all the kids. We will fire all the teachers. We will do a number of things that are equally as offensive as suppressing white um, education. And so the question is, um, not can we close the achievement gap, we can improve test score data. That is relatively easy to do. The question is how you do it. And so what I want to show you in the next couple of slides is some of the other things that we are not attending to um, while we are improving test scores. Also, what is in the interest of the public when, um, when considering school reform? What societal goods are schools expected to deliver? Um, and I'll reveal a little bit about my um, feelings on this. I, I, do, I just don't think reform is about improving schools. That's not what we should be about. We should be about improving communities. Schools, I mean, to, to remove schools from community context is a big mistake, and you'll see what I, I think what you'll see the reasons why I say that. One, the school to prison pipeline. We have the highest expulsion suspension rate in the country. In, in many schools, 50, more than 50% of the students are expelled or suspended. 50%. A large part of this comes from um, for the school culture movement to this idea that in order to gain control, you have got to create a series of incentives and punishments that can lead to suspension and expulsion. It can be things like your shoes weren't um, tied, you wore the wrong socks, you didn't have a belt on, you, and it leads to suspensions. Why is that a problem? And I'll think about Louisiana. Louisiana is the prison capital of the world. You know, we know um, statistically if you are expelled, your chances of um, getting arrested go up dramatically. One in seven black men in Louisiana are either in prison or on parole. One in seven. And so there is a school to prison pipeline. There is no question about it. And that is a consequence of improvement. Um, and I don't want to get 
too much into the prison and industrial complex, as some people call it. But we have a for-profit system because we can't fill, uh, because our jail in Orleans is filled, we then have to send prisons, or prison, uh, felons and other prisoners to other um, prisons around the state at a um, $23 a day per head. Um, so many towns all across Louisiana, um, this is their main source of revenue for the most part. And so there is not an incentive to not uh, arrest people, not to jail people. So this going back up to the first bullet, um, we've got to be careful in a pursuit of academic excellence that we don't exacerbate a probably more substantive problem in Louisiana. Educational attainment, I just want to show you a few data uh, points. Although we're increasing, everyone's increasing, whites um, um, receive a two-year degree at, at twice the rate of blacks. Whites are about the national average. Blacks and, um, are below the blacks nationally in terms of educational attainment. So that green line is um, our New Orleans, and the blue line is the national average. Um, Hispanics are above the um, national average. They've been generally flat. It's insignificant when you um, test it out. Median household um, income. Whites earn twice as much as blacks in the city. Blacks earn in New Orleans earn less than blacks nationally. Whites earn more than whites nationally. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing this to paint a picture. So one of the things that's a misconception um, or, uh, and when we debate school reform, in the main, except for this little period in the 90s and going in 2000, um, folks with a high school diploma in general, has, it's been improving over time. It's not at the rate where we want it to be for a highly industrialized country, no question. But it's been improving. Um, 45, for, and the, the blue is the black, the gray is the white. Um, 2009, 73% of blacks, but that was where whites were in 1980. Now in um, the city, 95% of whites earn a high school diploma. Now this is the scary part. Even, although we've been, been improving Nash, um, in terms of high school degree attainment, um, look at the employment rate um, for blacks in the city. So in 2011, 48%, 48% of blacks have jobs. So that means what? 50 what? 2%. 52% of black males in the city are unemployed. 52%. That's a dramatic. I mean, I, I don't think people understand the how damaging that that number is. And so again, I, let me go back. So we've been improving educationally. And I reason why I, always, I like showing this slide, because there's not a direct, we always assume that education will yield everything. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. One of the major reasons, we have 14,000 students in New Orleans who are considered disconnected, that's the new buzzword, um, describing the folks who are not employed or not in school. School between the ages of 16 to 24. 14,000, if 14,000 people were employed by the employer, uh, uh, a, a single employer, it would be the largest employer in New Orleans. 14,000 is larger than Tulane is larger than 
the University of New Orleans is larger than um, Loyola, Xavier, and Dillard combined. Um, say if we miraculously educated 14,000 people, we would not have the seats to put them in college. It's an astounding number. It is a district, a school district in itself. Remember, 40,000 students um, attend public schools. We're talking 14,000 um, who are not working or not in school. So this is somewhat a complicated slide, so bear with me. So 2010, um, folks who are, um, let me explain this right, those who are eligible to participate in, uh, that who are in schools now, who can participate in the workforce. So right now, folks in school can't participate in the workforce, so that's why you see the complete yellow. Not until 2025 will you, will you see, will you see 25% of the students who are in school now that will participate in the workforce. The reason why I say that is because um, we invest so much into K-12 schooling, and we say if we fix the schools, we will fix everything else. The reality is that it's not just about kids, it's about adults. If we want to fix the community, it can't just be on school reform. We have to have education in spaces that touch adults. Um, because schools are important, as important as they are to the longitudinal impact of a society. To deal with the here and now, which is also important, you have got to have some kind of educational strategy for adults. You just have to. So I'm also team lead for this organization called Place Matters. It's an initiative out of the um, Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. We look at um, the social determinants of health. I focus in on education and its impact on health outcomes. Um, last year, and we've been rolling them out all across the country, we um, take census data, we create an index, and essentially we look at life expectancy by neighborhood, tra um, by census tract. And if you pay attention to the red, um, that's in generally where black students live. Um, but in those areas, the life expectancy is about 55 years. In the yellow areas is where white folks live. The life expectancy is about 80 years. So I want to in this report, you can go to orleansplacematters.org. Um, we have a 25-year gap between the lowest um, income um, neighborhoods and the highest income neighborhoods, 25 years. Those determinants are around education, crime, um, um, access to healthy foods, Actually, access to health care is low down on the list. Um, number of bars in the area, there's a number of factors we, um, we examined. But, um, and you can get a lot more detail in that report, or you can ask me questions about it. But I wanted to bring that point up that schools can't fix things like this. I mean, it, it's, it, it is a much bigger, it can help fix, but it can't be the only thing that fixes. Heart disease is, uh, heart disease mortality is five times greater in the, in the black area. And, um, and heart disease is an interesting factor because it's not just congenital issues, a uh, congenital matter, it's about stress, it's about um, access to healthy foods, access to exercise, so on and so forth. Um, the mortality rate in general is one and a half times the mortality rate for white residents. And this is not because of the murder rate. Murder is a small, not, I mean, less than 1% of all deaths. This is a, because of all, of all those other factors that contribute to life expectancy. So, um, conclusions. Um, ref 
you know, we have to measure um, what we're doing in New Orleans, but what we're doing in reform in general to basic measure, basic quality of life measures. Because what I fear is happening in, in my former city and cities all across the country, you can improve schooling. You can make kids smarter and not necessarily make communities more equitable. You can um, improve test scores and not necessarily employ graduates. You can make schools better and not necessarily make communities healthier. Um, and, and that, for me, is a dilemma. Because then we have, uh, it's, well, it's not the reason why I got involved in school reform. Ultimately, I want healthy communities. And certainly, we have to have some faith and believe in the time it takes to improve communities through, with schools as a major component. But the reality is, like I showed you, schools can't be the only thing. And, and in many cities, businesses, churches, um, other entity, major entities have abdicated their responsibilities to improve communities by placing that responsibility on schools. And it's never been in the history of, of this country and others that schools were the only thing that mattered in, term, in terms of um, personal and um, academic development. Um, and again, this goes back to my point. Um, schools is, improving schools is not the goal. Improving communities is. And certainly schools help in that endeavor. But if you lose sight of these basic quality of life measures, you can lose your way pretty quickly. Very quickly. School reform must be tied to other social determinants of community wellness in order to maximize benefit. Now, this is where um, m my reform call, and I'm a reformer. Don't, I, I want to be clear. Um, some people think I'm the devil <laughs> because I've done a lot of things that were not the most savory things in the world um, in terms of fire people, in terms of... Um, um, instituting strategies that, in the end of the day, really didn't have a tremendous impact on children's lives. Um, and that's why I've come to this sort of space, where I'm always willing to try to improve, because if we were to continue the, the path we were on, um, clearly um, the communities in New Orleans, and particularly the black and brown communities of New Orleans, would not be in any better place if we continued down that road. And so I'm a progressive in the root sense of the word. I'm going to move. I'm going to move forward. However, um, I, I, I don't fall into this camp that we, can't, that we don't see school reform as an employment opportunity, as a health opportunity as all these up opportunities. And for me, as I think about how to transform a college of education, um, I've been thinking about, you know, the, the point of a school is to have self-deterministic, self-reliant communities. If we can't find folks in the community who can run a good school, hire community people, then we won't maximize the benefit. I can always find people from elsewhere to educate a school. But there's limits to that um, in terms of overall community growth. And so for me, um, it's not about saying um, school reform is bad. It's about linking um, positive change to community improvement. And that's just a hard sell to many of my colleagues because they are in the business of education reform. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. But I say this all the time, the goal is not to improve nonprofits, it's to improve communities. Bill, I mean, billions of dollars have been poured into New Orleans. Billions. 
Um, I just refuse to believe that when we contract, when we hire, um, when we um, um, buy, uh, buy consultants and so on and so, so forth, we can't find talent in the community to deliver those goods. We do need to find new talent. Every city does. But new talent can exist in a, in a community. It does not have to come from the same reservoirs um, that we typically find them. We can find new people, but they can be from the communities in which they serve. And it's that mix. And that's, in general, what I've been pushing for and working for. So I wanted to present that in, um, in that way and, and leave some time, because I know this group um, has questions. And so I'll take them right now and try to answer them as best that I can. And as before, I will be around with the microphone. Thanks. Um, so for the last two days, we've learned about, uh, we learned a lot about vulnerability of different groups. And I feel like we've heard a number of historical accounts where vulnerable groups uh, you know, are taken advantage of or their well-being is put after the profit of the group in power. Mm -hmm. in, in the case of uh, post-Katrina New Orleans with this influx of the federal money that you're talking about, can you talk about what, do you, what is your sense this industry that you, you just described um, directly or indirectly are people turning a profit that maybe is not necessarily going back uh, to the people that money is uh, aiming to serve. Is my question yeah, clear? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and there's a couple of areas where I think um, we can see a direct benefit. One is in school construction because it is, there's a component of it that is just blue collar labor. Um, and in New Orleans where there's a dearth of high skilled labor from local communities, we should have been able to leverage those opportunities to employ more low skilled labor. Um, certainly there it comes with a certain amount of training, um, not just the hard skill training around um, construction, but the soft skill about showing up on time. There, and, and this is another thing I, when I talk to groups, I want to be absolutely clear, folks need skill development. It, it, it is clear that um, it, there's a, almost a different world out there in terms of professional expectations, in terms of um, educational aspirations. And so uh, there needs to be certain amount, a certain amount of training. Um, however, um, like I said, particularly in that arena, we should have been able to hire more. And then on the teacher front, um, and I, 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 I don't want this to sound uh, um, like I'm disparaging teachers, but, if, but we have to be able to find local teachers to do this. The, um, education at the K-12 level is a service level type of job. It, it doesn't, re it's an, um, it, it doesn't require exp or importing talent from the outside. Um, similar to, they're similar to nurses, um, other fields where you almost have to um, take advantage of local economies or local the local workforce because it just costs too much to bring in someone for a middle-of-the-line, middle-class job. And so it's, it's costly to bring in new talent when you have it right there. And so um, the, one of the slides where you saw the large influx of new folks, um, if they don't stay and become members of the community, then we are wasting an investment. And so that's another point I always like to make. I could care less if you um, are from somewhere else. I, I, I was, um, I'm, came from D.C but I decided to invest in, um, in New Orleans. I bought a home, got married, had kids. Uh, I, um, I invested. Um, 
we should not create an itinerant workforce. That is not good for the long range plan of any city. And so, yes, that has, is occurring. Um, would I say it's all bad? No. We need new schools. We need new teachers. We need um, a lot of new things. I just don't think we're maximizing the benefit and, the, and it's leading to improved test scores, not necessarily improved communities long term. Hi. Um, so when you're talking about Katrina and the segregation, the poverty, you know, I, I worked in North Lawndale for a long time, which I think it's like one in four black males are in prison at any given time. And I guess what do we as teachers, I think we all have a sense of it, but what do we do? I mean, I think mm -hmm. in our city it's really confusing about what our role is. Um, I guess, you know, my husband, he's a child psychologist, and they go into the schools and try to teach first graders, like, how to share. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And do community stuff. But I guess I just don't know where do we, like, go from here. Yeah. Well, there's, well, let me, uh, there's a couple of things. So I primarily, because I focus on policy, I, I, most of the things you can glean are more policy solutions. But one of the questions is how you teach this to to children, or should you teach? Well, I, I, Sorry. Was, I was going to say, one of the things I wanted to recommend to you is that we should be using the, the immediate con political context as lessons in our schools. Because one of the, re the things that I don't think we're doing in school reform is truly empowering um, families and students with the knowledge of what's going on in, in and around school reform. Because many of the things that, that's occurring in our cities cannot take place without parents' consent. And whether you agree or, not, or do not agree, um, parents are allowing many of the, the, the things to happen. Um, if, but in my estimation, they don't have, and this is controversial, I, I think there's a requisite amount of information needed to make good choices. And in school reform, all this stuff is uh, as opaque as it comes. Mo even educators don't know what's going on. And so the more we can inform families, the more we can inform students when it's developmentally appropriate about this stuff, so when you're teaching in a social studies lesson, and in a, I, my, my work, I wrote a book on this stuff, but I fictionalized it for the sole purpose of families and high schoolers could read, can read it. So there are interesting ways um, to teach this stuff, but again, it goes back to that Du Boisian notion that folks need to be cognizant of how they're perceived so they don't internalize a lot of this junk that ultimately seeps in their bones and, and, and our psyches in a negative way. I, I guess okay. I just, sorry, as a policy standpoint, I don't know how familiar you are with the policies, education policies in Chicago, but as bit. far as the, you know, we've had ma mass school closures, we've had um, yeah. mass demonization of teachers in the press, and the strike was not very favorable in general as far as I think it was and it wasn't, depends on who you ask, what your circle is. What, um, yep. And I guess it's confusing to know what direction with our very low income, high crime, high murder rate communities, what the plan is yeah. for, from the city. Like what is their plan? And so like from a policy perspective, what do you, th like why would a government do that? Right. No, I'll, what I was going to do in, in the, um, originally I had planned is to put forth a vision of schools. But one thing I think we've done is um, schools and states, they put forth strategies to improve um, schools. We never have a vision of a community and schools in that context. No one's putting forth that ultimate vision of what we're, where we're supposed to ultimately hit. 
So no one has a sense of the end game. Because in many, in many states, there's not a real end game. It's to improve. And that's not an end game. And so, one, you've got to put forth a vision. But the other thing is, I do think, I do believe that we're in a very painful place where we have to decentralize and, and get smaller. And there's no answer to that. If folks are, no easy answer, if there are less folks in school buildings, there comes a point where you do have to make a decision. However, I think in a master planning process, communities have to decide where new schools are built, where new schools are formed. But let me tell you, school closures are one of the most um, dogmatic, um, top-down things that you will ever see. And I think that if you if you inform people, it's painful. It is painful. But I know, because we've done this in New Orleans after the storm, where that school was flooded. You cannot learn in it. Where do you want a new one? Community members came together. It was painful, because everybody wants their name. <laughs> you know, it was painful. But guess what? We developed the plan. Now, if you ask me, did the state abandon that plan and do some of their own things? Yeah. But, um, however, there was a planning process that it was incredible. Because you had, at one point, folks from Treme arguing with folks from um, down the road in the French Quarter. No, it needs to be here, blah, 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 blah. And they found the street. They found a plot of land. They made it happen. Because the reality is we had fewer students. That building was in horrific shape. A change had to have been made. But for us, there was an explicit sort of, you can't move in that building. That building can't exist the way it did in the past. I think the goal for a lot of stakeholders should be to make, put out that picture of, we have got to change. I need you to come on board, but we got to work together. And that's just not happening. There's no process for it. But again, you have to have a vision. But we need decentralization. And I just will add very quickly, I do think districts need to become smaller. I think we need to go kind of go back in time to neighborhood districts. Because the idea where seven or nine people can run hundreds of schools is ridiculous. And so um, at some point, I think, to get the level of community involvement, to get the level of community planning, you got to decentralize. But that doesn't mean get rid of all electoral processes. It means that neighborhoods have to be empowered to make their own decisions. The trade off of that is you can easily go back to a 1950s version where rich communities are taking care of themselves. I'm willing to take that trade off. Well, when you said, why would a, a school board or why would the, the, the administration do that to us, think of what the government did to Minamata in Japan, those, those 10 points. But um, my question is, what do you feel about No Child Left Behind? Oh, man, I think that, um, and I was in D.C. at the time. I was one of those interns um, when the Bush administration came. Uh, I actually thought, at the time, No Child Left Behind had promise. It was, a, it, was a, it was two things that bothered me about it then, and it proved true. Too much accountability is contradictory to innovation and growth. You can be so stifling that teachers and leaders will only do the things to achieve that end. And that's what No Child Left Behind did. In addition, it um, was unfunded. And so folks couldn't afford it. But I was one of the proponents of, hey, you do need new standards, new benchmarks. You just shouldn't have this heavy stick waving at people. Because too much accountability stifles innovation and change. And that's what I think is happening. All these folks, it's funny. If you ask me what, how do charter schools look in New Orleans, they don't look any different than a normal, in, 
in a regular school. They have all this freedom, but nobody uses it. Why? Because of accountability. And so I was always one of these folks, ah, I'm not, I don't poo-hoo no child up behind that much. I just think that they could have funded it at higher levels, and they could have backed off on the high stakes part um, a great deal. Thank you. Um, quick question for you. So you mentioned that they changed the standards somehow. Yep. The schools that were not failing or that were succeeding yep. suddenly became failing. How did they do that? And do you think that that was connected? And I immediately think there's some like political scheme behind it, you know. But well, there's always a political <laughs> scheme. But it, there, I mean. But how can you just up and like? Sorry. How can you just change, change that? Well, the, uh, folks disagree with me on this. However. When folks are gone from a city, it's a lot easier to pass legislation. When, f when you have a, a, um, a storm and, and failing schools combined, folks want change. Parents want to change. So there was a political will to get this thing done and to take away, take back schools, take back schools. Um, but that motivation was always there. There was just a window of opportunity that was presented because of the storm, and it be just became easier to mobilize the stakeholders who were not beholden to um, families and legislators and all these other things. If they did not, if they weren't for change, they would not have been reelected. There is no question. Uh, good morning. My name is Justin Mori. I was actually at University of New Orleans in 2005. Oh, wow. Um, in the College of Education. Um, can oh, you speak? Did I? I? We've never met. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, can you speak for a second to um, kind of these outsourced types of organizations, Teach for America, uh, New Teacher Project, kind of before the, before the hurricane and oh. kind of the, uh, just the, you know, warm body type aspect to uh, what the role is after the, the hurricane? And are they effective? Are they needed? Um, is it an old-fashioned idea? Yeah, it's um, interesting. So a lot of these organizations existed before the storm. They just didn't have um, uh, the numbers that they did. I think New Orleans needed new talent. There's no question. We needed new ideas. We needed fresh perspectives. Like a lot of other cities, folks are retiring at at, at, at high rates, so we needed new talent. I, I just, and I, and I may be repeating myself, I just think that we should incentivize new talent to come with people who are likely to stay in the city. Um, because it, it's that long-term investment that I worry about. Um, it, Malcolm Gladwell said it best, and I, can, I cannot find a better metaphor, although it's a sports metaphor and I avoid sports metaphors. But he said finding good teachers like finding a good quarterback, that they look good on paper, but when they are in the field, you see something different. I, and I experienced that while at the, when I was associate dean at the University of New Orleans, where, man, I could not tell. That folks would have stellar grades, um, stellar credentials, they get in that classroom and they were the uh, most horrible teacher you could find. And then you have folks who could barely put one good sentence in front of another, but could move a student. And um, I think there's a, a place where we should have, um, certainly have standards and expectations on qualifications. But the reason why I took this job at Davenport is I really believe that one, folks need to audition in schools for a period of time before, as part of their tra uh, training, long before, you know, the typical sort of, you know, pre-service teaching. And, um, I think you, you need to be introduced. I think you need to do long-term internships. I learned this from the nonprofit world that if you can do a long-term inter internship, get in a school, audition for that school leader, if you're good, they'll hire, if not, hey, hit the road. And that goes for all teachers. 
And I think what you're seeing in New Orleans, you see a lot of new teachers with a lot of potential, but you also see a lot of bad teachers who have no interest in staying, and it's a problem. So not to uh, get out of the question, but I agree with Malcolm Gladwell is that it's so unpredictable um, to find a great teacher that you almost have to do an auditioning in order to, to find them. I went through Teachers for Chicago. Mm -hmm. So really that idea makes a lot of sense because after I was done, I felt like they threw me in the classroom and didn't tell me anything. I was right. supposed to have a mentor and- um, It never happened. <laughs> not to the extent that I thought I should yeah. have a mentor. Um, but we, did, we were supposed to student teach and um, before that, so, but still going into the classroom by ourselves, not with someone to actually guide us. So the first, my first year was actually um, very interesting. I've been teaching for 13 years now, and I only had to give four years back in order to not have to pay for the exactly. masters. Um, so I, I think that maybe there does need to be some type of real live internship so that a teacher would actually know what they're getting into. Um, because the classes don't necessarily tell you, like when you write in front of them, it's a whole different type of ball game. But it seems like what New Orleans has gone through is what Chicago is going through. Like teachers, and I'm assuming it's the same in New Orleans, but teachers that have been working for a long time make a little bit more money than the new teachers, so they'd rather find new talent so they can pay them a little less and get rid of the older teachers. Um, well, I would, let me challenge that a little bit. I think the greatest benefit to young teachers, and this is coming from an uh, ed leader, you can run them through a brick wall. They, they don't have family obligations. They're there for hours on end. Now, that's abusive, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think why folks like young teachers in the main is because you can tell them anything and they're going to do it. <laughs> and well, that, I, I just wanted to, and that's not necessarily a good thing, but I think that's the reason why pay is a, in a, a, a factor, and don't get me wrong, but it's the, the hours in that I think leaders really like. But go and ahead, I'm sorry. I would say that's true for the most part, but I stay at work. I mean, I, we don't get paid for the last hour that we work, and I still stay at least yeah, two, yeah. three hours after that. So um, I guess my question deals with um, the failing schools. What, or how, outside of test scores, what else would label the school as yep. failing? Because we have several schools that don't have as many resources, and to me, the lack of resources is one of the reasons that the school can fail, not necessarily the test scores. Like if the students don't have the resources that they need, or you know, we don't have enough books to even let the students take a book home with them and bring it back. So then we have students who don't do homework and all these other things come into the picture because of lack of resources. Well, the, and I will reframe your question is in a way that is compelling, very compelling for me, is that how do you, one, measure um, and, a, and attend to poverty? Because for me, um, Poverty matters, and it shows up in schools. And students still have to be held accountable to basic academic criteria. You, you, there's no way around that. Folks should be able to dis demonstrate mastery on certain things. However, poverty impacts that. And I, was t I think I was talking to Vivian, um, I have to figure out, and I don't think anybody has a good answer for it, is how do you create a school that really addresses poverty and in a curricular way, um, in a developmental way, I do think we need to do more partnerships with um, social service agencies, with governmental agencies, but um, if you don't, if you do not pair schooling to all these other life, um, 
other life-changing matters, um, you'll have limits to what a school can do. And, I, and that's heresy for a lot of school leaders um, to say, because a lot of my colleagues will say, poverty doesn't matter, that we're going to push this. Schools are the most important factor in a, t a teacher is the most impor important factor in a kid's life, so on and so forth. But the data after 60 years of, are, are clear that of, of educational testing, at least from the national level, clear. Poverty matters in terms of predicting for um, educa ed educational outcomes. So it's the access to books, it's the access to language, it's the access to um, um, social um, things that provide social capital. Um, and so we have got to do that. The reason, but it be, it's an expense that taxpayers have to be willing to put forth. And it, and it forces us to change the nature of schooling. And, and, and this is going um, out there, but we've got to change this grade-based thing. It has to be a more self-pacing um, environment where we will take care of the educational needs in whatever time span is needed. And, um, but that is a hard thing, because you're talking about years and years and years of tradition, of policy, and, but we've got to change up how we teach and how we deliver schooling in urban schools, because it's just not going to attend to all these other societal ills in a way that makes sense. Let us thank Dr. Perry. Sorry. <laughs>